Welcome, welcome everyone um, to today's session on sustainable and efficient cooling um, for a warming planet. We'll be discussing uh, challenges and opportunities and solutions to bring um, sustainable cooling on the ground. I'm um, very honored to be here. I'm Sophie Bordat from um, the COP26 Climate Champions team, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I would like to first thank you, the government of Japan, for hosting this wonderful event and um, the UN Environment Programme as well for their leadership in raising awareness on, on this um, topical issue. Um, as an introduction to the session today, I'd just like to emphasize um, how important cooling is and what it meant for us at, um, the, within the Climate Champions team. Um, Cooling today represents seven percent of global emissions, and um, we we really um, pushed our campaign to, to bring um, cooling at the center of our of our campaign um, to first of all tackle these emissions, bring them to net zero by 2050 as much as we can, and and um, collaborate with non-state um, actors and businesses in particular, um, but also the importance it, that. Um, it means what it means uh, to bring a, a resilient future in a, in a warming planet. Um, so I think today's session is going to be um, fascinating and we'll hear from uh, wonderful speakers um, um, about the challenges they see, the opportunities there are. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today um, my, and, and um, introduce you to um, His Excellency um, Mr. Yutaka Shoda, the Vice Minister for Global Environmental Affairs of the Ministry of Environment of Japan, um, who will tell us about what Japan is doing today already to tackle um, this serious challenge. So, His Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you very much for joining this side event. We are delighted to co-host this side event at the historic COP26 under the theme of sustainable and efficient cooling. The demand for cooling is fast growing as the world is getting warmer and developing nations increase their purchasing power. The pandemic has also underlined the necessity of cooling when it comes to keeping vaccines effective and sto storing fresh food. While cooling technology keep us healthy and contribute on economic stabi stability for people all over the world, it generally relies on the use of HFCs as refrigerants, which have a very high global warming potential. And as a Kigali amendment, developing countries will also start to phase down the production and the consumption of HFCs by 2024. Nevertheless, the potential effect from HFC emissions remain non-negligible. The government of Japan has committed to reduce, reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 46% in the fiscal year 2030 from its fiscal year 2013 level. Specifically, Japan has committed to reducing its HFG emissions by 55% in 2030. To achieve this ambitious goal, Japan enforces strict regulations on users of refrigeration and air conditioning equipment throughout their equipment life cycle. In addition to the implementation of HFG's production and consumption phase down, on top of our endeavor is to reach the goal of net zero. We are also strongly committed to supporting developing countries achieving net zero. Japan believes in the importance of addressing end of life emissions from refrigerants. The key word is life cycle management. That is why in 2019, we launched the Initiative on Life Cycle Management of Fluorocarbons, IFL in short. Japan and our outstanding partners have actively promoted the concept of refrigerant management, especially in developing countries. Today's sad event, 
welcome distinguished guest speakers with diverse expertise, including on improving, improving efficiency, speeding up the Kigali amendment, and end of life management. Now is the time to enhance our actions on sustainable cooling. I hope today's discussion will be fruitful and inspiring. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Vice Minister Shoda. Um, great introduction to the topic, and thank you for setting the scene on the challenge that refrigerant represent today for the sector and sharing the leadership that Japan is taking on, on reducing uh, the emissions of coming from um, um, high global warming potential refrigerants. Um, I'd like now to pass on to um, Inger Ander Mrs. Inger Anderson, um, who's joining us. Um, Inger, 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 sorry, Anderson, who's from um, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and is the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Pro Program. So please, Inger, over to you. Thank you so much, Sophia. And to you, Vice Minister Shoda, thank you for your leadership and thank you for the leadership of Japan. And to the distinguished fellow panelists, my deep thanks as well. Um, look, the purpose of, of COP26 is to keep the planet cool, uh, a task at which we so far haven't quite excelled. Even the latest NDCs do not help us to catch up. We need to halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 to stay on the least cost pathway to 1.5 degrees of warming. Beyond this temperature limit, more than 2 billion people could be vulnerable to severe heat waves. This, unfortunately, is where we encounter that vicious circle uh, that we have to escape. The need for cooling in our daily lives will grow to protect people against heat extremes. But the way we cool our homes and workplaces is a major driver of climate change. Today, around 10% of the world's electricity is used for cooling, but that is set to double by 2030 if left unchecked um, by climate change. We will see heat waves, population growth, urbanizations, and the demands of the growing middle class wanting more cooling. So friends, it's obvious that we need a rapid transition to climate-friendly and energy-efficient cooling. It's equally obvious uh, that this transition is entirely possible. Phasing out climate warming of refrigerants under the Kigali Amendment, as we just heard from the Vice Minister, in combination with energy efficient improvement, can avoid around four to eight years of the total annual greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So this is just one piece of the cooling puzzle. We can do much with smart buildings, with investing in urban infrastructure, with investing in nature-based solutions, we can transform these urban concrete jungles into urban forests. And we know that the canopy will bring the temperature down. We can mandate green roofs and walls, and we can increase tree canopy and make our cities cooler and more livable and, frankly, much more pleasant. To give just one example, if we invest 100 million annually in urban trees, that could give 77 million people a one degree reduction in maximum temperatures on a hot day. And one people might say one degree, well, when you live in a hot climate, you learn to know the difference between 28 and 29 or whatever it might be. Governments and cities can do much to move to sustainable cooling at the national level. Policy frameworks can help shift markets towards energy efficient equipment and appliances, towards renewable powered coal chains, towards climate friendly refrigerants. Implementing energy efficient regulations for cooling products in developing and emerging economies can shave off 100 billion off of electricity bills each year and it can enhance the grid stability and reduce pollution from power stations. And it can provide uh, reductions equivalent to 500 large power plants offline. So countries can also develop national cooling action plans to cool sustainably, including through cold chains that keep food fresh 
and vaccines viable, as we just heard from His Excellency, through anchoring action on cooling in their climate strategy and through smart investments. So, friends, to move the cooling agenda forward, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, offers a comprehensive approach to accelerate action on the ground. The cooling challenge is complex. It cuts across the interests of many groups of agriculture, health, energy, the engineering and infrastructure, and environment and industry. To bring change, we need a coordinated approach, and we need lots of cooperation. UNEP and its many partners are bringing diverse groups to the table to create this coordinated approach. The Efficient Cooling Initiative under the Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, that, and the UNEP-led Cool Coalition are supporting countries, cities and industries to take comprehensive action, contributing to the Paris Agreement, to the Montreal Protocol, to Kigali, of course, and to Agenda 2030. And meanwhile, the, co the COOL Coalition and the CCAC have joined forces with the Ozone Secretariat, Ozone Action, the FAO, and Italy to help a nation slow climate change and reduce hunger through sustainable cooling and cold chains. To mobilize, the cooling, to mobilize investment, the COOL Coalition started the Cooling Finance Working Group with the Green Climate Fund, the World Bank Group, and the E3G. This group aims to help countries attract finance and help build capacity in banks to mainstream investments of sustainable cooling in their portfolios. So these are just a few examples. You will hear much more today. What we need to do now is to accelerate action and bring everybody under the tent towards one vision, a vision of a world which keep our planet, our homes, our workplaces cool by combining the right technology with the power of the natural world. Yes, we've gotten it wrong on cooling in the past, but now we know the answers and we have the coalitions and the will to make this happen. So we can and must make it right. And I know that with the leadership we will have today, we have every chance of making it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Inger. Thank you for those really inspiring words and laying out how cross-cutting cooling and the challenge of cooling is, and therefore how a comprehensive approach and real collaboration is needed um, in order to, to deliver these cooling services more sustainably. Um, so thank you again so much um, for, to our, our keynotes today for having introduced us to this, to this conversation. Um, I, want, uh, I want now to pass over to our, um, our speakers. Um, so I want to welcome uh, Yuri Osawa from the Ministry of Environment and uh, Makoto Kato from the Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center from Japan, who will both be presenting today um, their findings from the resource book for the life cycle management of fluorocarbons. So welcome, Yuri, over to you. Hi, thank you, Sophie, for introducing me. Do you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Great. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone and distinguished guests. Um, I'm Yuri Osawa, as introduced, and it is my honor to have a chance to present um, what Japan has done and Japan's experience and commitment to sustainable cooling. It was the last COP25 in Madrid two years ago when Japan launched the initiative on fluorocarbon carbons life cycle management. And at this COP, um, we are honored to um, have a chance to present. Um, next slide, please. Let me start by reiterating Japan's updated commitment. As Mr. Shoda, our vice minister, has previously mentioned, Japan has submitted uh, its nationally determined contribution, or NDC, which aims to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 46% in the fiscal year 2030 from 2013 level. Japan sets an ambitious target aligned with the long term of achieving net zero by 2050. 
Also, um, Japan will continue strenuous effort in its challenge to meet the lofty goal of cutting its emission by 50 percent. As for the reduction of hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, Japan aims to reduce its emission by 55 percent in 2030 from 2013 level. Cutting the HFC's emission by more than half is not an easy target to achieve, so Japan is committing to employ all the tools and measures we can use. The point is that we cannot achieve this only by the phase down of HFCs, complied with the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. Next slide, please. So in Japan, the HFC's emission consists of about 4% of the entire greenhouse gas emissions. The majority of HFC's emissions comes from the refrigerant, contained in existing commercial refrigerating and air conditioning equipment. Alongside the recycling mandates of domestic ACs and car air conditioner, we install strict measures on controlling the HFC's emission from the commercial equipment. So the first measure Japan takes might be very familiar to everyone. In accordance with the Montreal Protocol and its Kigali Amendment, Japan controls production and imports of ozone depleting substances and HFCs by setting the quota under the ozone layer protection law. We have completed the phase out of ODS, specifically HCFC, last year, and we have started the phase down of HFCs since, 20, uh, since 2019. And to this day, the actual HFC's quota has remained well below the limit set by the Kigali Amendment. Next slide, please. So the phase down of HFCs is going well so far, but I would like to underline that this is not enough to meet our goal. Um, yes, in general, the GWP of the refrigerant has started to shift to the lower and even zero in Japan. However, without any measures, plenty of existing equipment leaks its refrigerant when in use, and it will discharge its refrigerant contained in its stomach at its disposal. Cumulatively, it has an enormous impact on climate change, and that's why Japan what, that's why Japan addresses to prevent leakage, mandate the refrigerant recovery, and require the destruction or reclaim of the recovered refrigerant. We have enacted these obligations under the Act on Regional Use and Proper Management of Fluorocarbons for 20 years, going through several amendments. Under this regulation, the user of commercial lack equipment need to report the refrigerant leakage, do the periodical inspection, as well as dispose of the equipment properly. The registered operators are the only entities that can handle filling and recovering the fluorocarbons refrigerant in compliance with the standard, in compliance with the standard procedures that the government sets. Last but not least, the recovered refrigerant must be destructed, but not yet. Um, could you go back to that? Oh, yeah, thank you. So last but not least, um, the recovered refrigerant must be destructed or recycled by the operators approved by, approved by the government. Um, it's easier said than done, given the exponential numbers of existing equipment. But Japan is determined to implement these regulations strictly in cooperation with local governments who are responsible for the enforcement and we will disseminate the information to the public so that we will be able to meet the target. Next slide, please. So I hope now you see the reason why we need to tackle the refrigerant emission from the existing equipment, or so-called the bank. Addressing the HFC bank is especially crucial for climate change mitigation, not only in Japan, but in every country. As the demand for cooling rises globally, we expect a dramatic increase in refrigerant demand and consumption. One study suggests that even with the full compliance of Kigali Amendment, the HFC's emission is expected to increase about 2 billion tons CO2 equivalent in the later 2030s. 
That clearly tells why we need to address the HFC bank, and we need to do this in a comprehensive manner. Japan calls for worldwide action on the life cycle management of fluorocarbons. carbons. Life cycle management means a holistic approach in reducing the HFC's emissions, including reducing consumption, blocking leakage, in use, recovering the refrigerant, and destruction or recycling of the refrigerants. Next slide, please. So to raise awareness internationally, Japan has launched the initiative on fluorocarbons carbons life cycle management at the last COP. As I mentioned, Japan has been actively working with the partners, including developing countries, developed nations, international organizations, and private sectors. The picture on the left side shows the signing ceremony between Vietnam and Japan to join the initiative. We are currently cooperating to strengthen policy in Vietnam, which might be um, addressed later by Dr. Fui in this side event. We also offer capacity building training on refrigerant management for policymakers and technicians. Moreover, Japan has initiated the joint credit mechanism project in storing and operating FCAS destruction facilities in Thailand and Vietnam. Next slide, please. So um, this is a short summary of Japan's action to address HFC's bank. Japan believes that we can do more to suppress the HFC's emission as the issue is getting hotter and non-negligible for many countries. Japan will keep committing to raising awareness on the life cycle management of, fluor of fluorocarbons. And with that, we are very happy to share that our initiatives activities will be more interconnected with the, with the climate and clean air coalitions and as a new Korean and HFCs have that will start working in a few months. Japan is confident that we will be able to reach out to more countries and regions, and we will deeper, we will deeper our collaboration with the new framework. So now I'd like to invite Mr. Kado to introduce our first collaboration work between the CCAC and our initiative, which is publishing the resource book. So that's all for my presentation, and I will pass it to Kato-san. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Makoto Kato. As uh, introduced by yudie san I'm from Tokyo. I am very happy to uh, uh, speak to the, um, uh, our uh, new um, activities, uh, actually of the first activity um, about the uh, uh, face uh, resource uh, book for the life cycle management of fluorocarbons. May I have the presentation on the screen, please? So the draft resource book for the life cycle management of fluorocarbons are being drafted. And now um, I'm happy to say uh, this uh, has been already uh, circulated among uh, stakeholders, um, parties, uh, different um, experts. And uh, I have uh, actually well, finished well, on the very final draft. And then it's not going to be um, published uh, through the um, CTAC. And uh, this is going to be uh, put for the uh, actual use. Uh, for policymakers. Um, first, I would like to introduce the concept of the resource book. As uh, Yurie san uh, from uh, Tokyo, um, MEJ mentioned, but the uh, the awareness raising is extremely important because um, now um, the urgency of climate change and also uh, the uh, uh, importance of the Paris Agreement and the Kigali Amendment um, target, uh, this is actually well, um, um, pr very important um, um, uh, policy goals. And um, it is um, countries' um, uh, uh, responsibility that we are going to um, um, operationalize for well, that uh, uh, policy goals well, uh, within the domestic uh, uh, domestic policy realms, so that the uh, we are actually well, promoting for well, the uh, country's efforts uh, to domesticate for well, their uh, international uh, norms or well, into domestic policies and measures. And now um, it is very important to sh showcase for well, the good practices um, um, that, that are useful for the uh, for the strengthening for the this kind of efforts uh, in life cycle management concept. 
Yes, so that the, uh, we are actually promoting what the uh, replication by providing hints. Now, um, if you see um, various, uh, if you see all well, the uh, policy measures of um, life cycle management of fluorocarbons, um, some countries actually introduce for well, the uh, standards or regulation and banning, and some other countries actually uh, introduce for financial and uh, also fiscal instruments. And also um, transparency and tracking are, are also useful, and some others actually will develop to in partnership with the private sector or technical um, um, experts, um, certification and licensing um, schemes. So all these um, efforts, um, good practices, um, I would say more than 25 cases are in practice are actually uh, showcased for in this resource book. And, um, and also um, some countries, um, both from developing and developed countries, are uh, in efforts to uh, replicate for those things. And I think um, um, the, the, the efforts were coming from the um, CCAC's new um, strategy, well, strategy 2030, and the engagement strategy for the cooling. This is uh, what we, uh, we see as important vehicle for um, us, to, uh, uh, us to disseminate this kind of information and also uh, harness uh, country to country and also business to business uh, cooperation. Uh, what you see on the screen um, is actually uh, one of the uh, example of um, uh, uh, this resource book. As I mentioned, more than 25 cases are uh, diagnosed and, and uh, it is shown like this. So we have a, a project or like a scheme, so or also um, we, we see well different um, life cycles, um, for example, like a production or import of uh, refrigerants or like a collection and also uh, 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 recycling or, or uh, destructions. Um, these are actually um, uh, nicely uh, uh, laid out for, um, uh, in this resource book. And then you can see uh, summary of policies and also diagram of policies and also hints for why, why these countries are successful in implementing and actually well, um, raising ambitious uh, target of um, uh, refrigerants, um, uh, fluorocarbons management as part of the uh, Kigali Amendment, but also as part of the uh, Paris Agreement. So um, I think this is a really good uh, uh, showcase uh, for all, all the um, policymakers and the practitioners. Now the draft resource book is about to finish, um, but uh, before that, well, um, we, we are happy to also uh, invite uh, comments and also uh, some voice uh, uh, to strengthen our um, uh, life cycle management. And now it's um, available, it's uploaded well, on the OECC website, so you're welcome to uh, participate with this kind of uh, joint collaboration under the uh, CCAC. And also uh, we have uh, come up with the uh, very nice uh, uh, di diagram, um, uh, uh, infographic of uh, introducing uh, life cycle management of um, uh, fluorocarbons and refrigerants, uh, both contributing to the climate change mitigation, but also um, um, ozone layer protection. So uh, we're happy to uh, work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Makoto. Thank you, Yuri, for um, this great presentation and sharing the, the initial findings of um, the resource book and the importance of life cycle management of um, HFCs. Um, I, I really like the hints uh, for, for success and, and tips for policymakers to think about and um, introduce in, in the formulation of their policies. Um, so I'd like now to welcome our panelists for today's discussion. We'll hear more about what's happening um, in Vietnam, Rwanda, and Athens. Um, so great diversity here of experiences in terms of um, building a more kind of cooling, resilient, and, 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 um, um, and sort of sustainable cooling world um, across these geographies. So. Um, I'll introduce the panelists before we dive into the discussion. Um, so welcome uh, Luong Quang Hui, um, Head of Climate Change Mitigation Division of the Department of Climate Change at the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment of Vietnam. Um, I'd also like to welcome um, Faustin, Faustin Munia Zikwige, 
um, who is here um, as the Deputy um, Director General of uh, Rwanda Environment Management Authority of the Ministry of Environment of Rwanda. And then uh, virtually we're joined by Leone uh, Mirivili, who's a senior advisor for the Ashton Rockefeller Resilience Center of the Atlantic Council and is also um, the city of Athens chief heat officer. So um, welcome to you all. And, um, and um, um, I'll start the, the panel now. Um, I'd like to start the conversation um, with you, Mr. Hui. Um, um, Vietnam has recently um, introduced um, uh, action on cooling in its enhanced N NDC. Could you tell us a bit about, um, about this enhancement and why action on cooling is key for Vietnam in delivering their climate targets? Um, and what steps are you looking to implement um, to, to uh, meet your commitments against your NDCs? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Le Quang Hui from Vietnam, and I'm happy to share with you our progress in um, uh, management of air gas in Vietnam. And uh, uh, recently, the, with a new commitment to, uh, to achieve our targets to net zero by 2050, and also other efforts to, to reduce the EG emission, in, in particularly in uh, represent uh, the cooling uh, industry. Uh, may I have the uh, presentation, please? Uh, first of all, I would like to talk uh, about the uh, overview of uh, what are the uses of air gas in Vietnam, uh, which is the, um, mostly in the, the cooling industry in, in, in Vietnam, uh, both at the, at the industrial level and also household level. And secondly, that while with the changes of the uh, law on environmental protection that has been recently been passed last year in 2020, and also other bylaw documents uh, that are going to be issued very soon within a couple of months or maximum by by the next um, six months that we to, to guide the implementation of the law on environmental protection, uh, we will have uh, quite significant effects on the uh, management of, of air gas uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, the third one is about the ways forward, what we're going to do to achieve, uh, <coughs> to contribute for, uh, for, for uh, industrial uh, cooling industry to, to, to contribute to the NDC implementation uh, in Vietnam. Uh, first of all, is that for the uh, uh, sector growth in Vietnam is quite uh, rapidly, I would say, that while the development and growth of the, um, the RAC sector, especially the for air conditioning, has been largely driven by the Vietnam rapid development uh, with the increasing uh, income uh, increase and, uh, and the demand from the households uh, for the AC in Vietnam that uh, led us to become the second largest country uh, to, to consume the AC in Vietnam. And of course, because of our geographic and climatic conditions and getting hotter and hotter compared to uh, before, about 10, 20 years before, the demand for, for, for air conditioning and also other cooling uh, the machine this is actually increasing quite, quite significantly. Uh, you can see that in the the um, uh, for the market in Vietnam here, that while uh, is continuously increasing uh, during the period from 2011 to 2019, that during that time the economy is also booming, uh, ex um, except for the last year when uh, when we have to suffer from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and and noticeably that in 2019 there's more than 2.5 million units sold in Vietnam, which is quite significant compared to other countries in Vietnam. And the majority are the conditioners with a small cooling capacity used at the household level. And with the increasing of the, the uh, urban uh, urbanization in Vietnam, especially in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, the two uh, mega cities in Vietnam, that the cons uh, consumption of, of AC unit for, for the building is quite large. And the market share is dominated by big manufacturers like Daikin, LG, Panasonic, and, and some others uh, in Vietnam. Uh, the household uh, market has been also got a high growth rate from 10 and 12 percent and expect to, to increase larger uh, and higher. And the use of HFC is increasing rapidly and uh, because of the, the technology in air conditioning is also increased. And we will become probably the largest HFC consuming countries in the South Asia region uh, after Thailand and Indonesia. Uh, 
uh, with the uh, household freeze, uh, using, mainly using HFC 134A, uh, but the commercial freeze system uh, O type, uh, using HFC 22, HFC 134A, FC 404, 507, and 407 AF. And, and those are the used in mainly industrial sector, and especially the, the most it would be in the seafood processing, which is actually one of the uh, <coughs> fast uh, the, the developing uh, sectors in Vietnam. And about 25% of total freezer system using HFC 20, uh, 22 and 75% uh, and just 3 and 40% cold storage capacity operating on, on HFC 22, HFC 404 and, and 507. Uh, for the uh, freeze consumption in Vietnam, that the HFC 22 that's uh, well, quite quite constantly uh, increasing at the average of 3.5 uh, million tons, and the consumption FSC from Vietnam from 2011 uh, to 2017 got an average speed of 28 percent of that, which is actually quite large. And the total HFC uh, in 2011 is only five, about more than 500 tons, but in 2017 and 2019 is more than. 2,300 uh, ton, and that is the uh, the the, the uh, amount that we going to to reduce. But there's a the major changes in the past few years that well since we joined the <coughs> uh, Montreal Protocol and 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 Vienna Convention that we have um, issued a number of of uh, policies to to regulate use of F gas in Vietnam, but um, it's, it's mostly focused on the ozone <coughs> depletion uh, substances. And until 2016, when the Kigali Amendment uh, introduced, and we, uh, we approved uh, the Kigali uh, Amendment by 2019, and actually it's quite a good timing with the Paris Agreement that's approved by 2016 in Vietnam, uh, we realized that the HFC got a very high potential to reduce uh, GHG emission in, in Vietnam. So that is, is the, the fundamental change uh, in Vietnam. And that was in 2020, last year, that uh, the law environmental protection is being issued, and and with a with a dedicated article uh, 92 on on the law uh, to 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 uh, uh, to provide the regulations uh, mandatory uh, for HFC uh, consumption in, in Vietnam. So the, the law requires uh, a number of <coughs> um, the responsibilities by organisation and indiv individuals that will uh, also. Uh, uh, provides the responsibility mandatory uh, for, for, for producer and importer uh, equipment and producer and importers of the control substances, the substances are under the Montreal Protocol and, and also Kigali Amendment as well. And the owner of the equipment and con uh, containing control substances, for example, uh, like households who are using freeze and using AC also responsible, and the servicing units as well for, uh, for, for services uh, uh, industry. And that is, uh, well, in a way that we trying to <clears throat> not only uh, 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 looking at the, the, the HFC import and export in Vietnam or used in, in industrial level, but also as household level. And it's not only that those at, uh, responsible for import and export and also the use of, of, of the um, uh, HFC in, in cooling industry, but that would be expanded to other sectors as well. For example, uh, the, um, the uh, building and construction sector, they will be uh, have the responsibility to to use the uh, cooling uh, equipment uh, more responsibly to ensure that what well, the HFC uh, consumption would be the lowest possible and our colleagues from the other lime industry as well to uh, would be also got uh, the the responsibility to to use that uh, the, to implement uh, the law under under the guard the specific guidance that will come out in the next few months uh, there's a few things that we need to do uh, in the next uh, the, the ways forwards that would happen very quickly by next year. Uh, first of all is the, the, uh, the supporting for the implementation of national regulations uh, in line with the Montreal Protocol and of course the Kigali Amendment as well. And as a way we've been doing in the past 10 years uh, and coordinating with uh, relevant state management agency as I mentioned other lime industry as well to expand uh, the scope of management and provide more technical guidelines and building capacity to enforce regulation and uh, coordinating with relevant partners to create uh, uh, more technical supports to, to, to um, uh, different sectors and different uh, players and actors within the, 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 the industry. 
and exchanging and sharing information. And, and of course, that well, we need to, uh, to promote the public-private partnerships for it, because mostly it will be companies and private sector who are responsibility, uh, got the responsibility to, to reduce the HFC uses uh, in, in, in the industry. And, but most of all is that the more, more important is that we need to provide the, the, the awareness and perception to different sectors and different actors uh, within uh, the, the cooling industry to, to ensure that while well, the regulation will be enforced properly. And that is still uh, amongst the many challenges to come, but that is uh, what we're going to do in the next, uh, in the short term to come. Thank you. Thank you, Long. Thank you for, um, for sharing insights on what Vietnam is doing. Um, fascinating to hear about um, how you've been implementing the Kigali Amendment and clear regulations that you're putting in place, but taking a step further now, focusing on how you're engaging with your industry uh, to reduce the use of those um, HFCs. Um, I'd like now to, to pass on to, to what's happening in Rwanda and, and hear from you, Faustin. Um, obviously, Rwanda is the capital, a capital um, is the namesake of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol and is the first country to ever uh, adopt a national cooling strategy. Um, and it's now home to the first um, Africa Center of Excellence for Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain. Um, can you tell us about um, the strategy and um, the efforts that um, your country is taking forward to achieve um, its climate targets? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, for giving me the floor. Um, Rwanda, what is doing to uh, implement or achieve its climate targets? First of all, let me elaborate more on the target, climate target of Rwanda. Uh, last year, Rwanda submitted its updated uh, na uh, national determined contribution, and uh, it pledged to uh, uh, reduce 38% uh, uh, of our uh, emissions by uh, uh, 2030. And to achieve this, it will require 11 billion uh, of uh, US dollars, uh, uh, but 60% of that money will be uh, 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 conditional, which will be mobilized from outside, and 40% will be the contribution of the government. As you all know, Chigari Amendment uh, uh, was adopted uh, in Rwanda in uh, 2016, and uh, 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 if this Chigari Amendment is uh, implemented well by all countries with uh, uh, energy efficiency, you all know that it has the potential to avoid at least 0 0.4 uh, 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 degrees Celsius of increase uh, 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 by this century. So uh, this is uh, 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 very important to uh, link the Chigari Amendment and the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement, if it is uh, asking us to limit to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and Chigari Amendment uh, can help us to uh, reduce at least 0 0.4, uh, you can see the clear linkage. So uh, what are we doing in Rwanda to uh, um, minimize or to uh, 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 achieve the target? As highlighted, Rwanda, uh, first of all, uh, conduct, uh, have developed its uh, uh, national uh, uh, cooling strategy. Uh, uh, the cooling strategy uh, uh, portrays uh, uh, priorities of the country, what are the challenges, and what are the key uh, 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 strategic actions we need to take. But before conducting the uh, uh, national cooling strategy, uh, we had uh, together in support with uh, uh, UNEP, we have conducted uh, a market assessment uh, 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 to see what are the challenges we are facing. And we saw that we are having three main challenges. One is pertained with uh, 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 awareness of uh, uh, farmers and people uh, who are uh, involved in the uh, agriculture production and post-harvesting. Uh, 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 second, is uh, uh, the lack or limited uh, 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 capacity of cooling in agriculture, which 
uh, mainly uh, 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 results in loss of uh, the uh, agricultural production. Uh, uh, last but not least, we saw that uh, 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 cooling is uh, cross-cutting from different sectors, be it agriculture, be it health, be it industry, be it research. So uh, 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 that uh, 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 those three uh, challenges uh, uh, led us to develop the uh, national cooling strategy. So uh, 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 in, in, uh, in summary, our national cooling strategy portrayed uh, 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 the uh, uh, urgency needs of raising awareness from different uh, 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 key stakeholders, including farmers, including uh, customs officers, because they are the ones which are dealing with the ozone depleting substances coming from outside. We don't have uh, 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 we don't have factories, but we are uh, receiving from outside uh, training as well researchers who can do some research. Uh, indeed, uh, we uh, worked on. Um, uh, 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 MAPS, what we call uh, minimum uh, uh, energy performance, uh, 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 which can at least indicate uh, which standards of re refrigerant uh, uh, we can use. Uh, uh, so uh, indeed, uh, the establishment of the landmark uh, uh, Africa Center of Excellence on cooling, uh, on sustainable cooling, uh, which has a headquarter in Chigari, especially in the uh, University of Rwanda, uh, created a synergy between researchers, uh, farmers, and industries. Uh, and we uh, believe that uh, with this center, it will help not only Rwanda, but also uh, the whole Africa uh, uh, as a region, because we are sharing. We have so many. Com uh, we have so many things in common, uh, especially when it comes for challenges on cooling. So uh, 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 we uh, believe that the center will uh, help to uh, uh, bridge the gap on uh, losses of, of products, uh, uh, production in agriculture. Uh, will help us to bridge the gap in uh, uh, other areas uh, 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 we need to improve. That's what I can say. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Faustin. Great to, to hear that the Africa Center of Excellence for Sustainable Cooling and Cold Chain is being implemented and is able to, to share more knowledge and work with farmers, industry, uh, and decision makers in, in implementing more holistic intervention for sustainable cooling. Um, so I'd now like to um, invite uh, Lenio, who is joining virtually um, this discussion. Um, Lenio, hello, welcome. Um, you are the chief heat officer in Athens, in Greece. Um, and um, we've heard recently that there's been a few of these um, heat chief officers being appointed in different cities, I think in Miami, um, in the US, and in Freetown in Sierra Leone. Um, can you tell us about your role and um, how important it is and what can we expect from you and your fellows um, around the world? Oh, I think you're on mute. How is that? Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Hello, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. I wish I was there uh, in Glasgow with you all. Uh, um, the role of the chief heat officer indeed started um, this summer with Miami-Dade. It was um, a collaboration that took place between the municipality of Miami-Dade uh, and then the municipality of Athens and then the municipality of Freetown with uh, the Atlantic Council Resilience Center and specifically the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance. Um, uh, so part of this collaboration is that uh, the cities will be working and getting technical support from the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance. Um, and each city is going to have one person who is going to wake up every morning and worry about uh, how to keep the city cool. 
how to make the city cooler and how to uh, protect the most vulnerable uh, populations to heat. So, um, uh, as, as, as was mentioned already, uh, it's a multi-variable uh, phenomenon to try to handle uh, heat. It, it, uh, a lot of different sectors of, of the city has have to collaborate to um, actually create a comprehensive uh, strategy. Uh, dealing with uh, cooling the city and with protecting the most vulnerable. Uh, in my mind, there are three basic categories that um, I um, am working on. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, awareness raising and um, in general uh, communications and, 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 and trying to, to get the people to understand the, the, the dangers that uh, heat waves and extreme heat as a weather phenomenon brings about. It's still not uh, um, prevalent in the minds of the people that this is a very deadly phenomenon. So part of what we think will be a sea change in this uh, in this aspect is to start naming and categorizing heat waves, which we will do for um, the first time. I think Athens will be one of the first cities that will do this in the summer of um, 2022 um, to start uh, figuring out um, the categories of heat waves which will really be very important for policymakers also, because then you can have specific types of um, actions rolling out based on the severity of the phenomenon and the type of um, methodology that we are trying to use in collaboration with me meteorologists in Athens and meteorologists from the um, Science Committee of the Extreme Heat Resilience Alliance is to create a methodology that brings together meteorological data with health data, so that for every specific um, area or city, we figure out what types of uh, meteorological um, conditions are the most um, dangerous. And then based on that, actually uh, uh, figure out the types of categories. So this is very, I, I, we're very excited about this. And this is a very important issue, especially for um, people that are uh, involved in policy making. The second, the second uh, big bucket is what kind of policies can we set into motion that um, can protect um, uh, that can protect the people during the heat wave. Um, and um, the, um, we have um, a large, we have a big percentage of the population in Athens suffering from energy poverty. Um, so um, it's, it, there is, of course, this constant kind of um, um, tension between um, the issue of, of air conditioning and trying to quickly find ways to cool buildings and cool the city so that we, we don't need air conditioning, we don't need so much air conditioning. Um, unfortunately, unlike the previous speakers, we don't have a baseline study about how much air conditioning we have in the in the in in the city. So this is part of what I'm um, I'm planning to to kind of figure out and have a study about the. Um, the numbers that we have of air conditioning units within the city and and actually the use of them how many are how many people are actually able to use them uh, because of again energy poverty but so uh, there's a whole kind of uh, other bucket with how do you actually uh, make sure to protect the people while they like an emergency preparedness uh, plan and then the last uh, the last bucket has to do with a more um, comprehensive approach to the city uh, as a whole and how to make it um, lower temperatures what kind of policies can you bring about to make sure that whether it's nature-based solutions or whether it's um, different uh, materials or different technologies or different ways of um, dealing with um, the, um, the, the, the buildings themselves and the, the type of, um, of um, uh, consumption that these buildings have so that we can make sure that we can lower temperatures. So these are the three main kind of um, main buckets that uh, I'm focusing on. So the first one has to do again with awareness raising, the second one with mostly protecting people during the event, and the last one with kind of how do you design the city. And um, 
I'm now planning also uh, uh, the strategy and we are all, all three of us, all uh, chief heat officers are at this stage because we were recently appointed. And um, we are very kind of eager also to, uh, we're, we're, we have in our hands the um, sustainable cooling handbook for cities that uh, very recently came up from the, from the, um, um, the cooling coalition of UNEP, but together with uh, uh, several other people like the um, uh, Global Covenant of Mayors and RMI, they came up with this extensive and really kind of robust approach of how to um, set up um, a comprehensive um, sustainable cooling strategy for cities and how to kind of find what the specific trigger points are that um, are the uh, kind of the quick wins uh, for a city where um, uh, we can really start focusing on, like for example, when a city um, is planning a major development, a major redevelopment of part of it, or whether you know a city is um, updating uh, codes or zoning requirements. These types of moments are important moments to really. Um, uh, start putting in uh, the the type of um, uh, approaches that we really need uh, for for reducing heat in urban you know on an urban scale and and actually on um, reducing the cooling needs of buildings and finally uh, on uh, making um, um, making more efficient the the way that we we approach cooling um, within buildings. Uh, as we are attacked by heat. So this is an extremely important um, tool for us. And um, it's it brings a, a kind of knowledge and a kind of uh, approach that um, I think is quite unique. Uh, so I'm hoping that um, starting with the three, these three cities, but also with our connections to um, our networks, because um, we, I mean, most of um, most of our, um, I mean, most of our cities that are really um, uh, combating heat are, are usually part of either the um, cool uh, cool cities networks of C40 or part of the um, community of practice of the resilient cities network or um, etc. I mean, we're in these uh, networks that we exchange information and we exchange uh, best practices and what works and what doesn't work in our cities, uh, which is extremely important because uh, this is how we can really scale up uh, what we're doing and um, and how we can really keep cities which are now finally realizing that heat is a very big problem and uh, a lot of cities have been have not been really um, uh, working on on issues of of heat um, which we sh we should have been working on for decades now so um, it's still not a priority issue for a lot of cities and i think this last year has been or the last two or three years rather have been really catalytic in in this realization on the on the level of many different um so many different levels of government so anyway i will finish by saying that um this this uh, it's a very important uh, part of of um, of the of this COP uh, the the um, the focus on on uh, race to zero and race to resilience, which uh, actually brings for the first time also the the idea of of um, of trying to figure out how we are impacting uh, through the race to resilience people and how we can measure how we're impacting people. So I'm I'm kind of very much looking forward to uh, moving fast with uh, putting plans on the ground and um, and accelerating uh, the um, the transition to uh, creating really a much more thoughtful and sustainable way of dealing with uh, cooling methods uh, in our cities. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lenio. Uh, fascinating to hear some kind of concrete reflections of what that means um, at a city level. Um, and and um, great to hear that there's actually some tools um, that are being developed and thought for um, more holistic planning and in terms of, of heat 
uh, extreme heat in particular, um, and how cooling comes into play um, in, in this context. Um, thank you for reminding us of the launch of the, of, of the RMI um, handbook um, uh, with all the, the case studies um, that were collected on, on um, experience of um, sustainable cooling intervention in cities. Um, I think um, this panel really kind of um, um, brought the attention on, on awareness is clearly a, a kind of a common topic that is, is needed, whether it's um, learning um, better practices on life cycle management, uh, raising capabilities within industry um, on managing HFCs or um, raising um, capabilities within the farmers communities of the potential for sustainable cooling and helping them reducing their food loss or um, um, helping cities understand the dangers and, and citizens understand the dangers of heat waves and extreme heat. I think that's been um, really fascinating. Um, but maybe it'd be nice to kind of uh, um, lend a, a one last question um, to this panel, um, which would be what, what challenges and opportunities um, and solutions do you foresee for, for 2022? Um, and then what is your call to action for other countries and cities to, to uh, kind of accelerate um, this movement towards tackling um, cooling missions and bringing sustainable cooling solutions on the ground? Um, so I'd like to pass on first to uh, you, Luong, um, to tell us about your thoughts on, on, on the future in, in 2022 and onwards um, um, in Vietnam. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, with the uh, commitment we made here uh, this year from the government of Vietnam, uh, first of all, and also with the um, uh, recently updated NDC of Vietnam, and uh, we uh, expect that that's going to be um, a very comprehensive planning uh, for all lime industries at the government level, <clears throat> and also the uh, industrial sectors, uh, commercial sectors, uh, to, to uh, develop their own action plans to achieve uh, what would be um, committed within the NDC and even more than that. And uh, also we would expect to have um, the uh, co collaboration of the development partners uh, in Vietnam uh, and, and also from other uh, bilateral and multilateral partners as well to support us technically and financially uh, on the um, uh, areas of work that we committed here in, at, at the COP. Um, so we, uh, <clears throat> uh, for particular in, within the cooling uh, industry, uh, we, 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 we wanted to, to expand the scope of activities for quite a long time already. Um, but that is still some hurdles to overcome uh, uh, within the industry especially technically that how to, to make uh, the cooling industry more sustainable and greener. Uh, if, uh, and, and, uh, uh, to, and also the, as a household level as well. And that is, is, is the most uh, difficult one uh, to inc uh, improve the perception of people, of users, the end users um, to uh, reduce is not only the uses of, of HFC in the equipment, but also the uses of equipment themselves, you know, to ensure that well, we, we, we have uh, what uh, to, we, we can achieve uh, what is possible uh, within the country. Yeah, thank you. Great, um, thank you, Long. Um, um, great call for uh, kind of households and industry to really accelerate the uptake of more sustainable so solutions uh, that are less harmful for the environment. Um, I'd like to pass on the question to you, Fosting. Um, so, any challenges, opportunities, or solutions that you foresee for 2022? Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, all challenges uh, uh, Rwanda is facing is mainly shared uh, with the, most of the sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it is patterned with the uh, uh, lack of uh, efficient cooling facilities, and also. Uh, 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 loss of uh, various uh, agriculture products. Uh, so the opportunity uh, I see, I see it in uh, uh, landmark uh, 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 
uh, Africa Center uh, of Excellence on Sustainable Cooling, which has been established uh, 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 in Chigari uh, in partnership with the government of Rwanda uh, uh, and uh, uh, various, various academics from uh, UK with the support of DEFRA uh, and uh, UNEP. So this uh, center has the potentials of uh, 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 from 22 and upwards has the potentials of bridging the gap between researchers and farmers. Uh, we, uh, 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 in Rwanda, we have a slogan saying we need to put people at the center of what we are doing. So if we are putting people at the center, we need to make sure that the center uh, 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 the, the center of cooling, uh, uh, Africa Center of Excellence on uh, Sustainable Cooling, uh, uh, can uh, be the vehicle to uh, uh, at least uh, support farmers to raise awareness and understand what are the dynamics of uh, reducing the post-harvesting losses and what are the benefits and indeed, uh, 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 the center can uh, help uh, countries to run from each other because the center will be uh, 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 working for the whole continent and it can help uh, uh, countries uh, uh, to share technology, to share uh, uh, knowledge so that we can uh, be where we want. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, Chigari Amendment, last month in October, we celebrated the fifth anniversary of Chigari Amendment. Uh, but there are some countries, now we have more than 120 countries that filed uh, the Chigari Amendment. So another uh, opportunity uh, is that we are calling all countries which are not yet ratifying the Chigari Amendment to do so, so that it can help us at least to uh, avoid the 0 0.4 uh, degrees Celsius uh, by this century. So it's a, a, a big potential which we need to work together and together we can achieve, we can be far. Thank you. Great, thank you, Faustin. Great call uh, for other governments to ratify the Kigali Amendment and, and call for collaboration. Lenio, over to you. Do you have any um, call to actions um, uh, to make for, for 2022 and beyond on sustainable cooling? We can't hear you, sorry. <laughs> I keep forgetting <laughs> no problem. my microphone. So the call to action is is there. It's it's ringing on our ears every day. The the world is heating up, and the cities are warming twice as fast than the rest of the world. And um, it's eight hundred percent or more people are going to be facing um, third, above thirty five Celsius degrees of temperatures in cities uh, by 2050. This summer, um, because of the heat waves uh, that we had in, in, in Greece, we had an extra 2,300 people that died because of the heat. So this is, this is like a, a real challenge for cities. And uh, the call to action is to, to really quickly uh, try to do uh, as much as possible. And, and um, the, what I mentioned was the, um, I think it's really important to start being much more concrete about um, um, naming and categorizing heat waves. I think that is really um, a quick win uh, for raising awareness. Um, uh, I also believe that um, it's, it, it's very much, um, um, I feel like cities are, are becoming more and more um, connected and more and more um, 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 are, t are becoming uh, are in the f in the front of of, um, of solutions of of using um, innovation and finding funding for innovation. So this is like what I I think we really need to step on. We need uh, the the private sector to be much more uh, hands on with cities and um, and uh, in um, and uh, startups and innovative kind of solutions so that we can we can find. Um, 
ways to to um, accelerate the work that we're doing and um, and I think that that's that's it to accelerate the work that we're doing and 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 really getting the dialogue happening between the needs uh, of the cities and the um, and the and the, um, the private capitals that can be uh, invested in um, in solutions. Thank you, Lenya. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now hand over to um, Kevin Fay um, to uh, share a few uh, remarks to close the discussion of today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to all the excellent presentations from our country partners. Uh, you've learned, we've heard about many of the lessons that we've learned out of the Montreal Protocol process in terms of the importance of cooperation. And yet we, uh, from Jap our uh, sponsors from Japan, have talked about the need in the, in the importance of life cycle management, uh, training the ser refrigerant service sector, the need to bring the private sector in to help with technology innovation that's energy efficiency, low GWP, and utilizing renewable energy. And as well, the processes also emphasize the need for access to cooling and refrigeration in the face of a warming world. Um, another program that we're working on under the Climate and Clean Air Coalition is the Global Food Cold Chain Council, which is see seeking to reduce food loss and waste and greenhouse gas emissions through expansion of a sustainable cold chain. These things are all possible. This is a message of hope and optimism, I think, for the climate policy process of all the progress that has been made in this area that we can, we can show to other sectors uh, uh, around the world of, of what is possible. Um, the lessons you've heard today from Japan, Rwanda, and Vietnam outline the solution-oriented approaches that the Climate and Clean Air Coalition has been championing, championing uh, around the world. And nations need to work to develop their national cooling plans. And nations need to work to include cooling and refrigeration in as part of the NDC, their NDCs as part of the climate process. So if you ask the question of what are the, what are the big challenges for 2022, and right now I, I would urge that one of the biggest challenges, the, com the countries are listening on this topic. Everybody's listening. We're great to have, because of the progress of, of leaders like J Japan, uh, Rwanda, and Vietnam. Um, but the biggest challenge, I think, is going to be finance mechanisms to assist with the capacity building uh, for other governments to do their cooling plans and to get a handle on that, number one. And number two, uh, financial mechanisms to help with the, the uh, development of uh, sustainable cooling and sustainable cold chain programs that can be utilized to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to protect the health of our citizens, and to uh, also then benefit from an environment environmental standpoint, our warming planet. So I think in, in some, it's a tremendous positive message. Uh, there's a lot of work still to do, um, but I think that we have a significant head start here and we want to continue to pursue these paths as lessons for our other governments and industry partners and NGOs around the world uh, to help bring about the solutions that are going to help give us a, uh, a greater planet and a, and a greater uh, existence on the planet. So thank you for so much for organizing this. And again, thank you to our government partners for all their hard work.